Uh, designer, uh, UX, IA, any other discipline? Yeah. Yeah, a few, okay. But it's mo mostly for developers, but there's bits for designers as well, so I hope you'll something up. So, um, introduction as, uh, as told. Um, I'm from Emma Davis. I want you to heckle me on Twitter. I want to like on video or not. Um, I'm a freelancer. I've uh, been doing it for just over a year. I blog as Code by Monkey. I blog uh, myname.com and I'm a Cajun podcaster. Um, it's basically going to be some big wins. We've heard why response to is a good idea. Um, I want to give you something for the takeaway and put into your projects tomorrow. Um, so before I continue on, who's doing response to design day in, day out? Okay, so about a third of you. Uh, who, who, who doesn't really know enough to feel confident to do it daily? That's what I'm going to Okay. Um, right, this isn't giving me my preview, so that might be useful. Right, so first, HTML forms. Uh, HTML5 gave us Am I allowed to swear? Um <laughs> 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 HTML5 gave us a load of new uh, form elements, uh, which primarily just alter the input that you write text into. Um, so obviously we've gone from basically input type of text uh, and password to all of those. Um, so this is what email, uh, the input type email looks like in our first <coughs> input. And if you notice, this has got the Ampersands and the dot there. So you've probably all seen this before, but just not maybe not realised it's there. So this is for page for five in action. And it, uh, the different input types give you different keywords. So telephone number gives you a, a, a keypad, which is what you would expect. And this is all good and well. You, know, uh, you can use the you can use most input types on the desktop, and you just get a normal text box. That's what you expect. But when you go to do things like dates, I mean, who's, who's tried to fill out like, a booking form online and you click the date and you get one of those things that will expand? And do you have anyone? So I'm trying to explain it better. So, um, so who's booked something where you put a date in like, on a desktop website? Before most of you do. When you go to click the date button, you click the input, and one of those little calendar things pops up and you try to click the time limit button as well as possible because there's always one time that you don't So can you speak up? Sorry, um, a bit closer. Um, uh, yeah, I'm breaking it. Um, <laughs> so, but my main point on this was, uh, if you, most sort of sites that have a calendar, um, you, as I say, you click it, thing opens up. You can't really use it on a phone, and it's a pain in the ass to use, and I've just given up so many times trying to buy something or book something. Um, it's really annoying to have. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just going to go to the next slide. So, um, yeah, so to, to, to prevent sort of annoying desktop things getting in your way from essentially losing sales, um, we have like tools like Modernizer to, you know, to detect stuff. So, this is a, uh, we, we're not assuming, we're not assuming anything. So, we test the device. Uh, to see if it has like a native date picker like I was saying, it had like a scroll thing which is far easier to use. And if it doesn't have that, then you just load in probably jQuery UI or something like that. Uh, okay, so another quick one. Um, so I'm sure we've all done sites where you have like a nice grid going across and you have boxes like products or something, or boxes going across and repeating. Um, what if you wanted to do that vertically? Uh, so for this we have CSS columns. So let's just take an unsigned document. Let's just say the content class is a blog post. And all of the items inside that could be paragraph text, images, lists, videos, whatever. If you don't add any style to them, they'll stack like they are on the right there. Um, but using CSS columns, uh, you can say split that column, or split that, that element into two columns or three or however many, add a gap in between. And then you get something like that, which um, sort of comes from the newspaper sort of style of design. But notice how box three is split in the middle. That's um, not quite what we wanted, and I did this recently in a client site. And it looked like that. And as you notice that the first list item is on the bottom left, it just looks a bit, um, well, it's, it's missing the end of the sentence, or whatnot, and it's not ideal. And to get around this, uh, inline block is bit of a hack, but it works. It means that elements, uh, including images and other versions of Firefox, it would split an image, so it'd have half the image at the bottom and half of the top. Uh, 
um, using an in, in, uh, inline block on the elements and stops that happening. So we get this, which is what we hope to see. Um, you can see it's all we've fixed that issue there. This item on the bottom left isn't there anymore. It's the whole list is because it's display block, it's been forced into its own column. Um, obviously, this being responsive, when you get smaller, boxes are going to get smaller, so immediate way to the rescue. Um, hopefully, using things like this, you won't end up with two or three times the code. Uh, obviously, you need to apply five or six prefixes for that. Um, and while I've got media query on the screen, um, just a little takeaway. The, in the last one, it says media screen and, and that's where you don't need the screen and. If a browser can't see screen and, it assumes it is a screen and, and just adds that in for you. So you can save yourself so eight bytes. Um, that's good. And then that gives you one column. So if you're starting mobile first, which is debatable whether you should or not, um, you'll get the goal at media groups that add more columns as you get wider. Um, Hover on mobile. Oh, Sorry, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, okay, so hover on mobile. Um, right, so I don't know, you might not have noticed, but if you're doing something like, uh, with JavaScript on a uh, normally desktop website and you click something, if you ever notice that you wave just the half a second or so before anything happens, that's because it's doing, uh, that's because it's a click event. And the, the phone or touch device needs to know it is a proper click before it does anything. So it waits about 300 milliseconds, which feels like an age if you're in a rush. Um, so in the new, um, uh, new device and stuff, we get new, new CSS. Um, and this is for, uh, you might have seen it on, on some, uh, in some websites where you click a button on a responsive site and instantly you get sort of background color or something like that. And that's, um, this still to make it. And it's quite a small thing, but if you're if um, if you've got an Ajax driven website and you want the users to know immediately that click something while waiting for every milliseconds, then that can sort of really help. And that just gives uh, a red transparent background colour. Um, and in JavaScript, uh, there are more uh, more events than this. But to get around to 300 millisecond delay, uh, you can just listen for a touch end event, and there's a link at the bottom that just describes. Uh, gives you examples of what I'm talking about much better than that. Um, so in jQuery, rather than doing uh, dot click waiting ages, you just do a touch end. Uh, and the, <coughs> the, uh, the click event happens immediately, which is nicer. Um, okay, Retina, or IDPI, or whatever you want to call it, buzzwords. Um, so, icon fonts. Um, Anybody know any icon fonts? Well, so, yes, <coughs> um, this is for more, more designers and developers. Um, so this is uh, GitHub's icon font. It's called Font Awesome, which is great. And there's about 350 icons in there. And because it's text, it's infinitely scalable. It's, it works on any resolution, obviously, because it's just text. Um, but, uh, and the one sort of takeaway from, from here is that, uh, now, being a freelancer, I get sites from loads of different designers, and some know about font, uh, icon fonts and some don't. Um, wouldn't it be great if a designer used an icon font, and all you needed to do was drop in the actual font, and it worked perfectly? Wouldn't that be ideal? Um, but if you were to get uh, your, you know, your designers to, to use icon fonts in their design, rather than trying to retrofit an icon font that you found, an SVG, which is somewhere. Um, that would be really good. Um, this is just the web application icons, and I'm, I'm sure you can't read the text even at the front, but there's hundreds in there from clocks to close buttons to that free line that we always use for, for navigation of phones. It's hard to. So, chances are, if you've got icons in your, your application or your website, you can use it. And that's, um, if you just Google the word font, also, awesome, it'll come up with this. And that works for like my six, seven upwards. So there's no excuses really. Okay, the downsides, obviously, not being in images, there are, it's just one flat, one flat vector, so you can't, uh, you can't have, well, ordinary things you would do with images. Um, you can't have like background images behind the font, behind the icon, for example. But um, there is a trick you can do, which I've learned from a few people. 
if you're using the pseudo elements in CSS, um, you add the unitary character as the content, content attribute, and then you can sort of stack them together. So if you've got an icon form which is built in two halves, you can stack them on top of each other and have like, uh, you know, like a, a brown box with a black thing over the top, like a house, you know, just rather than just one solid icon. Um, okay, then we need sprites. I'm sure we're using sprites, aren't we? Very, very, very much. Um, Retina sprites? Anyone? Sorry. Listen, sorry. Um, keep standing up. <laughs> I wasn't expecting a microphone, to be honest, which is a bad thing. Um, okay, we need sprites. So, uh, so, so we all know sprites on, you know, on the normal desktop 1x resolution, or 2x if you've got a Retina Mac like um, well, actually, mobile, mobile is more important for Retina than desktop, but nonetheless. Um, so, we don't just have a 2x resolution, do we? We have Android, some Android phones are 1.3, <coughs> uh, then it's 1.6, and you know, every variation in between. Um, and what I tend to do with sprites now is I just have one 2x sprite, and then if you give it a background size of half the sprite, uh, it makes it the normal desktop size resolution. And then you just uh, and you give it the background position as you'd expect, and it means you're only loading one asset. It might be a bigger, but if you're really angry, you can do media queries and serve the right swipe, the right sprite to the right device, which is uh, a better way to do it. But if you haven't got time, or just a two x sprite is probably good. Um, and I know none of you can read that again. Um, it's a media query for a two x resolution. So any iOS device sold in the last like, two years will use this. Um, okay, content images. Uh, right, this one's a bit of a, a bit of a black hole. Um, there's still there's still discussion going online about the best way to do content images. Um, and rather than add to the discussion and make things worse, I'm just going to show you what the W3C are proposing will be the new new element for you know, multi-resolution images. And it's a picture element. So inside there, we have uh, three source tags with well, different media queries with different, you know, different size and different image. And if you can, I don't know if any of you can see, but there's a second attribute on the middle two uh, source elements, and there's a 1x and a 2x resolution image in there. But as, as we expect for HTML, if it doesn't recognize any of it, it will just keep traversing the tree until it sees something it does recognize, which is an image tag. So, um, if you were to use this now, we would only see the small image because no browser supports it yet. But there are, there are JavaScript polyfills for this. Um, but then you rely on JavaScript, which isn't good. Um, it's a bit of an old trick, but it's becoming more important as, uh, as sites get more and more flexible. So, <coughs> vertical alignment without, excuse me, uh, vertical alignment without, uh, without fixing it. So, who's done the, the line height hack where you want something to sit in the middle of a box? And we all know that, and we always do. Right? What if you get two lines of text all of a sudden, or it's translated into a German example, which is a third longer? Than it might split up. It might split up two lines, and you get well, all of a sudden it's not centered properly. So, um, we're going to use tables for this one. Uh, so, this is an example sort of what I'm on about. So the text on the left is centered perfectly. Um, this isn't a response to site, but it sort of shows my, my point. So let's just do a minimum viable example. So this is what we're intending. Um, but if you were to fix the text on the top, say with a position uh, absolute or something like that, the text would still start at the same position, but it would sort of go further down than you want. And that's obviously what we want, isn't it? Um, so, we use table-like structure to a certain extent. So this is, uh, so we've got a bit of a table wrapping two divs, a class of cell, an image in one, and some text in the other. And this is, this is the uh, CSS for it, which is arguably simpler than other methods of centering stuff. So the table has, uh, the different, different class of table on the outside has a display of the table. And then the left and right side have a display uh, table cell attribute with vertical line in the middle. And that basically works the same way as if you were to do an actual table. Because um, table text is inherently uh, vertically aligned in the middle. 
So um, that's bad. That's good. That's semantic. Um, obviously, divs could be besides articles or whatever. Um, and so, so what does it mean to you? I know I've sort of skipped through this, which isn't good. But using sort of things like this, it means that there is kind of one of no excuse to to not do responsive stuff. It isn't it isn't hard. You know, you pick up you pick up little tricks like this, and they sort of work their way into our daily daily work. Um, and we really do owe it to our users to give them responsive sites. I, mean, I, I can't really say any better. We owe it to our users. You can, we've seen many, uh, you know, many reports online where companies have quadrupled you know, their sales just by having a responsive site. So if you do any sort of e-commerce, I think it'd be silly not to. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I really am expecting to have one here. Probably outside, throw it exit.